All right, awesome. So I've got Greg McPullen from Burford Capital here with me at Legal Week 2019 on the 43rd floor of the Hilton and Gravity Stack and Heretic Suite. I am thrilled to talk with Greg. Is number one, we have like multiple friends in common yes. and multiple like industry contacts in common. Totally. And yet we've like never actually come together. Right. And what's great is this or- originally had reached out to David Perla, but I've Clearly, David has decided <laughs> that for branding reasons, he is too cool for Legal Week. It left don't, you with little old right, me. Let me tell you, don't, don't, I want to, I want a little note to David. I'm well aware of that this was a deliberate decision. David now works at Burford. He is above the legal industry and as a result made the conscious decision to go to London to this London week. During there is, week. Let me tell you something. Come I know on. David too well. There is nothing that wasn't planned and thought out. He is specifically not in legal week that's the best legal week marketing he's ever done oh boy but i get it means i get to hang out with you which, which is, is awesome which is awesome I'm so greg just before we get into burford capital yeah. and legal yeah. capital which yeah. is my, one of my big topics of 2019 yeah. give people a little bit of context if they don't know who you are how you got into the legal industry oh, cool. why you chose this random industry to, to, to totally do work in random uh you know what and it's funny because i, I was saying earlier before i I joined you up on the on the at the table. Uh, whenever I sort of walk into the Hilton for legal tech, I sort of reflect on the first time I walked into the Hilton for legal. I still call it legal tech. What was then legal tech, now legal week, um, and it was for <laughs> the, you know my first job interview when I was transitioning from the sort of law firm life, the practice of law life. You practiced where? I practiced, I was at Howery in in DC, uh, in their antitrust practice group. And uh, it was, you know, it was sort of post 9-11 and the world had changed massively. And, uh, you know, I was one of, you know, many, many people who were sort of really kind of taking stock and saying like, this is not what I want to be doing. Yeah. I'm going to make a shift. And, you know, in the backdrop of what was happening in the world at that, at that point, it was very easy to say, I'm going to leave the practice of law. I'm going to leave Howry. I'm going to buy a house in New Jersey with my, with my wife. You know, we had just been married. And, um, you know, going to kind of sort of come back home to the New York area. I was born in Brooklyn, raised in Staten Island. And, you know, my family was here. And it was important to sort of, uh, you know, to do those things, particularly in that background. Sure. So I had been for the two or three years or so before this sort of, um, you know, th- this important job interview that I was taking at, at, at Legal Tech, I had been a client of uh, sort of a, a new e-discovery company that was out there in the market and doing things differently um, vis-a-vis what we now think of as electronically stored information. But at, at that point, it wasn't, it, it, it was, it, they were just electronic files. They were emails and, sure. and uh, you know, um, um, documents, um, e-documents, e-files. Uh, but that was applied discovery. That was, they were a Seattle-based, venture-backed, e-discovery company who was who you know was doing things differently and they were dealing with native electronic files and I had been um, sort of using that technology at the firm at Howry for a few years and I had sort of become you know one of the young lawyers that was able to sort of explain this to the partners. I'm so and, glad you say this because yeah. I, I got you know I get a lot of associates will email me and say, Hey I want to I want to get into legal tech. I want to yeah. do something and yeah. how, how do I make that happen? And one of the things I tell them is just start working in like closely with whoever your law firm's oh, totally. vendors are. Totally. That's like the if you want to understand what it is they do yep. and develop a relationship with them. Yep. That's that's your play, and your it may not be the the sexy AI company <laughs> yeah. that, that you that you that you saw you know tweeted about. Yeah. But if you want to see the companies like your law firm is working yeah. with some tech companies. Yeah, be that person. Took be the person who manages that relationship. Ask for it. Hundred percent. At the law firm, they're not like, hey, no, no, no. I manage that vendor relationship. I don't want you. <laughs> right. They want that off their yeah, desk. Absolutely. Like if you're a young associate, go and right. jump on that. And stuff. if and if you're living it, you know, why not have that sort of close proximity yeah. and that connection to the people that are sort of 
helping you, right, do that job and bring value. Now, at what point did you then get involved with what I now call the P3 Mafia? So, um, so I, I wound up, so I joined... Which is pl- way more niche and nerdy than, 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 the, PayPal, <laughs> than right. the PayPal Mafia. <laughs> right, right, it is. It's a niche mafia. Uh, so I, I, I took that job. I joined Applied Discovery. I was with Applied Discovery through their sale to LexisNexis. I was there all in close to six years. And in 2007... Met David and 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 Sanjay, and they. I knew they were massively onto something, and we had been sort of in the industry talking a lot about sort of outsourced document review and and sort of what that meant. And there were still those like sort of peace of mind, you know, issues and questions like, can you do this? Can non attorneys review these documents? Can you send them to offshore locations, the Philippines, India, etc. Um, and I thought this this is sort of the next big thing. This is the next wave. And well, do you remember like what specifically like set off a light bulb in your head? We were like, oh yeah, because like I, obviously Pangea, yeah. Pangea three is is unique. And I, I'd, I'd say there's actually Thomson Reuters has a pretty good track record here. Yeah, but. Pangea 3 is unique in that it was, number one, a very successful company, yeah. and I would say it, it was a 10x successful yeah. acquisition, yeah, which is so sure. rare, yeah. um, but it has been yeah. wildly successful for all yeah. parts of Thomson Reuters' yeah. business. Yeah. Do you remember when you th- what you saw that made you go, yeah, I'm signing it was, on here? It, well, it was two things. One was sort of market-based, and the one was specific to Pangea 3. The, the market-based thing was, I remember... It was in Midtown Manhattan. I don't remember the exact venue, but I remember being the sort of applied discovery moderator on a full day sort of e-discovery technology in legal, um, uh, uh, you know, conference event. And one of the things that we talked about was sort of document review and, and, and offshore document review and outsourcing doc review. And it was this amazing, really organic conversation between, you know, the people we had on the panel, me as the moderator, the audience. I remember uh, <laughs> I remember an attorney from Tories, Marshall Sklar, God bless him, was in the audience. And we were sort of having this really, um, uh, you know, really passionate debate about whether or not we can do that, like whether that or not that can be done. Can you use non-lawyers to sort of review documents? And I was like, damn it, absolutely. You know, I was a college like, you know you document should, review. You know, you know what you shouldn't do is ever building. have lawyers yeah, review documents. Yeah, exactly. I was like, They're bad this at is it. crazy. <laughs> how, are you, how do you not see this? So that for me was literally, that was the moment I was like, this is happening. This is a thing. Yeah. This is going to happen. This is big. Um, and then specific to Pangea 3. And specific to Pangea 3. It's those two guys. Those two guys. I mean, you, you, you know, I, I mean, you meet David and Sanjay, and their story is just yeah. absolutely amazing, and they're wonderful guys, and, um, you know, really sort of team centric and about sort of pulling people in. And it was just, I, I just knew it was a special place and, you know, a, a place that I wanted to be at. So I, I made that shift and joined in 2007. Sort of three years before Thompson and, Reuters, and Reuters. now you and David are both at Burford Capital. Yeah. Yep. Now, Burford Capital is the world's biggest litigation funding firm. Yep. Uh, right. I don't. I want to. I want to be clear. I don't actually know the numbers in terms of how you guys are with like like Wellens and all. The, and, and and I know Bentham has got a big fund, but I, when I when I mean by the biggest is you're the blue ship brand. You are you are the leading brand on on um, on litigation finance. Now, litigation For fund sure. litigation finance is a space that I'm very familiar with, but I, I I'm almost convinced. Well, David is is has already convinced me that maybe the term litigation funding is not the term that we should be using anymore. And maybe and, not. <laughs> and then now this this is what this is what gets really interesting, right. and the the fact that going back to what you just said can non-lawyers reviewed documents offshore what would that look like and what i try to explain to people now about not the term litigation funding but the term legal capital is what if you start asking like could we invest in a law firm like why have we not thought about this and i always joke to people i'm like listen 
if you could, if I came to you tomorrow and was like, hey, you know what you can invest in? Like, that guy's a real estate project. Right. We, we can invest, we can actually can have a that. piece of his real estate right. project or right. her real estate project. And right. we're going to get like dividends for a while. And when they sell the building at a profit, we'll, yep. we'll, we'll make some, some even more money, some more money. Yep. Right. 100%. Now, just take that exact scenario and say, well, what if we could invest in a law firm? And I said yeah. to someone recently, and you, said, can, and you can now in the UK, right? I mean, so you so you can now in the UK. Forward. But what I'm looking at is litigation funding. The way that Burford has been talking about it more and more publicly yeah. is not about betting on cases. It's about what can we fund where we're investing in Boyd Schiller or Quinn Emanuel or Gibson Dunn. How can that happen? How and why can why can these firms not benefit yep. from growth capital yep. the same way any major enterprise yeah. would? And, yeah. and and this is where I think things yeah. are getting really really interesting. Yeah. And it goes to your point that you guys already have a track record internally of saying, "Hey, why couldn't we do this?" Yep. And you guys hit it the first time. So now, why can't we do this? Yeah. And, and look, I mean. You know, Burford had been along uh, around for many years and, and, and has been very successful, you know, before David and I joined, sure. for sure. But but you're absolutely yeah, your public, right. Your publicly filed, filed yeah. documents show that y'all have you, been doing you, you ridiculous, that, yeah, exactly. ridiculous you returns. Oh, so, okay. like, you know, we, we that, that's that you can guys can go look at, go, go, right, go look, look at go our look 2017 at, annual report. There you it's, go. It's all there. <laughs> um, yeah, that, and that's totally right. But for sure, what, what I see in Burford is... You know, it's that uh, I think of it as the sort of next wave, right? You know, I sort of did e discovery early on and that sort of legal outsourcing and technology in the form of Pangea 3, Thomson Reuters. And, and for me, this is just a natural, like, this is how, you know, we believe we can really make an impact on legal through. Um, you know, through the use of capital and, and financing and giving lawyers, you know, sort of access to the capital markets that the rest of the world just, you know, very mundanely enjoys on a regular basis in the form of corporate finance, you know, for legal, for law firms, for corporate legal departments, it's it's a little different and, and they're not quite there yet. Um, so there's, so yeah, there's, your, there's two trends that I see right now and yeah. it looks like they're about to have a... a I don't want to say a, you know a, a collision, but they're about to meet. And the two trends are mm -hmm. as follows: is number one, legal capital, and how y'all are thinking about it. Yep. And number two, the atrium model. Mm -hmm. Right. So atrium has raised I think sixty eight, seventy million dollars yep. in growth capital. Yep. They have two different entities. They've got a law firm. And they've uh, got a software company. Yeah, right. And the software company is what's raised all the money. Yeah. But very like a lot of that success of the software company is tied to how the firm can grow. Yeah. And sure. I, who who is Atrium competing with? To me, it's obvious. It's Oric. Mm. Right. Atrium is going after every one of Oric's clients. Yeah. They've they've got a brilliant method for doing that. And yep. I know people kind of like there was there was a lot of what is, what is this Atrium thing? When I right. saw <laughs> those. That two entities split, right? And how they're doing business, I said those guys did their homework. Yep. I know they yeah. have. They Justin yeah. Can has no experience in, yep. in, in legal other than as a consumer of legal yep. services, but they yep. did their homework and they're about to cook with gas. And yeah. And now I see this. That what what's what you also see happening is many firms are beginning to start entities around a tech practice. Yeah. So we're actually here in Gravity Stacks uh, sponsored media suite. Gravity yep. Stack is a entity that is wholly owned by Reed Smith, there are others. There's Emerge at Troutman Sanders. There's Cognition LLC, right. which is Hunt and Andrews and Kurth. There is Clifford, um, Chance. Clifford Chance. There's KPL there yeah. K or KYL, which is uh, um, Kiesel Young and Logan. That's uh, Justin mm. Hectus's group. There's, mm -hmm. there's a number of these firms that are sure. starting these. Now, I don't think they're starting them in order to raise money. They're starting them because they've decided this is a sort of practice it's group that's not, off. it's, it's not different. exactly yeah. law, so we, it shouldn't sure. sort of function by the same rules as the law firm, but this is right. a good business for us. Right, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, King and Spaulding's Document Review Center that's been around for, it, you know, 20, 25 it, years. Right, and then Morgan you, Lewis, uh, and then you also, yeah. what I have, what I refer to as the least, in, the, the, the least sexy but most interesting trend in legal, which is 
the unbundling of law firm back offices. Yeah. Every sure. someone, someone asked me, what's the most interesting trend in legal? And I was like, back offices. Like, they were, what? what? Not well, sexy at all. <laughs> imagine you're a you're imagine you're a big law firm in New York City right. and you've you're taking out two floors of real estate for the yeah. back office of the firm. You don't right. need that, so right. what are they doing? They're putting it in right. and, Wilmer Hale did it in uh Man- did Dayton, I think. There, there, there was in Dayton and Manila and right. Kansas and Tampa. Did there. it to your point in yeah. Wheeling and so the, the yeah. now that you have these back offices you've got these entities yeah it, it looks like that's the perfect setup for a team like Burford Capital to be invested to be, again I don't yeah. think the law firms did it for this reason right sure but it now it, but, it, but it, now it, it creates the opportunity right it creates you've the got, opportunity you've got an entity that is not a law firm owned by lawyers right which in the US at the moment prevents sort of outside capital from coming in yeah you've got a new entity that is a separate you know a separate PL, a separate entity not owned you know by lawyers so not doesn't prevent sort of outside capital from flowing into that and yeah to your point you know we think the industry we certainly think burford has evolved to this you know legal finance or legal capital place where it's not just about certainly not just about financing you know, single case litigations that, that sure. sort of make sense for us to invest in. I mean, we still do that, of course, but but th- there's much more to it. Um, and, you know, we think of ourselves as set up to, you know, underwrite and understand legal and regulatory risk. And we've got um, an enormous volume of capital ready to deploy uh, against you know an investment thesis well, and theses and, and, that and that's, that and that's, you know, that that's are legal the, and regulatory. That's the, the that's the, the other market. trend is is the efficient markets, right? In other words, if you're a, yeah. if you're a hedge fund trader today, you have a much bigger challenge than you had 20 years ago. Sure, it's a lot harder to get rich off hedge funds today than it was sure. in the early 90s yeah. because the market caught up. There's been correction and traders are now having to come up with a lot much more opacity. right. So yeah. now, so now you have like you know, Burford is kind of like a hedge fund, right? I mean, like that's... Uh, I mean, in, in some ways, you can you can think of us as... Um, and, and we have a private fund business, obviously, that you can, you can read our annual reports and, you know, the part of our capital structure is private funds. Um, we, we sort of think of ourselves in many ways as, to your point from earlier, you know, an investment bank, private equity for legal, yeah. right? I mean, you know, we've got, again, we've got investment theses that are kind of underpinned by our ability to really understand in a, in a, in a really robust, rich way, legal and regulatory risk. And we're willing to commit and deploy capital against uh, against our ability, you know, to right. kind of take on that risk so there's, in smart ways. So there's two trends that I see. One, one of them I understand well, and the other one I want I want some of your more of your input on. So. Okay. So the, the the one trend is, I now know there are boutique litigation firms. Yeah. That have basically been started either by someone who worked in like the, you know, the attorney general's office or mm-hmm. you know an ADA for years. People who have lots and lots of trial experience. Sure, great that then, lawyers. That, great lawyers. That, you're talking going Yale, Harvard, Stanford firm. lawyers. And yep. we're now we're saying, I don't need to start my practice at a big firm. Yep. I can basically raise money and get off the ground, run a lean and mean shop and have a 15 lawyer firm that's highly successful and I never have to do my big law time. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's very easy to understand and I, I think that's, an, you know, if I'm Burford, yeah. what I'm trying to figure out is like, what groups... Right. Inside of Quinn and Boys and Cassowitz Benson, who can we pluck off and get? Right. The, like there was the same way that a venture capitalist right. out in Silicon Valley is looking at the most successful teams at Cisco and Google sure. and Intel and saying, "Hey, who can we get off to?" to what, what are you going to be doing next? And yeah, can we fund you on that next. Venture? Exactly. So yeah, there, yeah, that yeah. that one's easy for me to yeah. understand. My question is, what is let's say, Scadden Arps can get a hundred and fifty million dollar credit line or equity investment somehow right. from a Burford Capital. What does Skadden or Simpson or any of the major big global law firms yeah. do with a significant investment like that? What does that do for them? You know, for the for the big firms, this this is this is a little tricky because you sort of have you have a in, in my mind a couple of different categories. You've got big firms that are just you know they, they just they, they they charge hourly and they get those hourly rates and. You know, go with God. Like they're they're fine, right? You, you, they don't need to really innovate around how do we take on risk, etc. Now, 
even within those firms, though, what you have is you have sort of pockets of practice groups or lawyers, partners within uh, within those firms that are saying, hey, I want to build my practice, right? Okay. I have not been here for 20 years. I don't have sort of institutional clients calling me. How am I going to build my practice? I'm competing with a host of other firms in my city or in sort of secondary or, or tertiary cities in the U.S. And, and, and this is a fight for me to get these clients in. So it's those sort of pockets of partners and practice groups, often at those big firms that you're, you're talking about, mm -hmm. that um, you know, might be interested in a relationship with a funder. Because we can, looking at their pipeline of cases, looking at maybe an individual case, kind of seeding a, a portfolio investment, sort of help them go out to the market and get some of those clients in, you know, win some of those client engagements, knowing that they've got us behind them, right? But that's that's sort of funding, <coughs> you know, a specific sort of group that is within a, a, a big firm like that. Um, As opposed to saying, we're making an investment in SCAD, and we're saying, we're going to make an investment in Scadden's new FCPA practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, investment in any FCPA, FCPA practice and a big firm like that is tricky because it's you know it's sort of defense side it's, yeah. it it doesn't really kind well of though Warren very well, Warren Buffett has been apparently buying lawsuits for years on, right. the, on the defense side on the defense side Warren Buffett I was just Dan Katz was showing this in a presentation he did at MD Elevate right. um, out in Utah in November he was showing that Warren Buffett has been buying cases on the defense side hmm. figuring that he can get them or he and his Legal team can resolve them, them, can resolve them better, and he and he's making, he's making, and he, he's and making the, he's making like a, a vig on like settle lamb for for lower than has been set aside and taking a piece exact, of that exactly exactly well so he's selling and, like and an insurance product exactly which yeah. he has experience anyway right, you know, sure. Geico and yeah, yeah. meaning he he get and obviously he just gets everything and makes right. money on everything he does right but. Yeah, that's that's right. so. It, I think we could start like seeing. And again, right. you got you're in this. I'm just right. sort of a spectator on the side. Right. But I do think what's so interesting about what you guys are doing right now is. Remember, I was talking to David and I was saying, you know, what kind of message you guys going to go out to market with David versus Goliath? And he's like, mm. and I'm like, and I'm like, yes. why not? And he's like, well, I just I don't think that's what we're trying to get across. Yeah. And he said, we're not. This is not about like you know empowering the little guy. He said, what this is is. The investments in a really good asset class. Yeah, for sure. These are you know complex commercial disputes. They're you know um, um, you know sophisticated parties typically on either side, and um, yeah, and you, you know th th this is not necessarily that you know that sort of David Goliath cartoon that you know. No, you know, I know you. I you can't think about. I know you can't give us like the you know predictions. I'm, I'm yeah. sensitive to the fact that you're, you're you're in a public company, but sure. If you were looking at, at the industry right now, and uh, not a prediction, but most important trend yeah. right now in in legal as it concerns Burford Capital, what, I, what, what, what do you think people should be aware of? I, I, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, and, and you sort of hit on it when you talked about, you know, the innovative, small you know, law firm that, you know, hived off from a big firm or came back from the government. Rishi Bandaris of the world. Right, exactly. Like those the um, actual tallest human being alive. <laughs> he and Joe Borstein, I think they're it's close. A, it's a it's a runoff between <laughs> Joe Borstein, Rishi Bandari, and Yao Ming. <laughs> um I, so 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 that so so those types of firms and also again the 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 sort of sometimes hidden pockets of you know, lawyers at the bigger firms that are willing to take matters on risk. It's those types of firms and those types of practice groups um, coming to litigation funders and using capital to really build out their practices and, and be receptive to clients that are saying, hey, I'm not interested in hourly rate engagement. I need some sort of return on fee arrangement. Um, I need you to go on risk, law firm. When they're not able to do that and go on risk fully, if they have a funder behind them, it gives them lots of optionality. Is there any, so that's is there, is there any evidence, just on as a follow-up, is there any evidence yet suggesting that when lawyers take cases on risk, the outcomes end up being better? 
Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, you don't understand why I'm asking. Yeah, that. yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think certainly... Logic if, would tell you that, yes, that would be the case. Of course, yeah. Anytime exactly. you've got skin in the game. Yep. And, and you know, that, that causes law firms to be really precise about the matters that they're taking on risk, right? Um, and if a funder gets involved... You know, that's a second sort of pair of eyes that have said, yeah, this this makes sense. You know, this case is meritorious. It's a winner. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna de-risk you by you know by by financing a portion of this. Um, certainly, you hear from law firms all the time that you know they want to many of them anyway. You, you know, want to build those pra- those contingency practices or partial contingency practices. We hear lawyers, presumably, we hear because, lawyers you know, say it, a it, lot it of things. We I hear lawyers right. all the time talking about how we're all going to move to AFAs and then. Doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not. Uh, right. Not, not according to predictions. That's right? what I call. That's what it's, 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 that's le- it's legal. That's legal <laughs> conference talk. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, the second thing that I that that we that we we, we see and, and we believe will happen is really, um, you know, the the corporate side. You know, the, the litigation finance. If you look at, we did a 2018 survey. Um, you've probably seen it. It's on the website. Yeah. I mean, it's you know readily apparent that. There, there still needs, you know, we still need to do massive kind of awareness and education about what litigation finance or legal finance really is and what it, it is mm-hmm. not. Lots of people think they know what it is and say, oh, yeah, litigation finance. Hulk Hogan and Peter that. Thiel. Yeah, exactly. They have zero idea. Um, but we're beginning to see some of that messaging and, and sort of education kind of take hold on the corporate side. So that corporate lawyers are beginning to say, well, wait a second, you know, we've got recovery programs that, we, you know, we can we can look to litigation funders to help us with our recovery programs to go out and, you know, assert our, you know, valid meritorious claims against, you know, partners or third party manufacturers or what have you. Right. So that they can start bringing in some real dollars into their into their legal departments. I had a. Um, a colleague, Rufus Kane, who was on a panel yesterday with Tom Sager and some others talking about this this kind of very topic. And there's a lot of excitement about, wait a second, corporate legal departments can use litigation funding, legal funding, you know, for their affirmative recovery programs. All of a sudden, if you could start thinking about, you know, a legal department, you know, raising capital through these affirmative matters to defray, you know, their defense costs and maybe even switch the balance and sort of make, you know, a, a cost center or a profit center. I mean, that, that's massively sort of game changing. Yeah. Sort of aligns them more with the business as well. So you can start having interesting conversations with the CFO's group and, you know, the CFO and, 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 and talking more with a business hat than a legal hat. Well, listen, Greg, I, I think if anyone can do this, it, it's going to be your team. And I don't say that because I just like you guys. It's because you've already, as you suggested, Appreciate you've that. already done this once yeah. in a very similar space. I, I think that legal capital, I, I, I understand people's sort of instinctual objections to litigation finance. I don't think they would have that same objection to legal capital. And I think that if legal yeah. capital becomes Great. the standard, then we're, we're going we're going to see money moving back yeah. into the economy in such a healthy yeah. way yeah. where Hey, listen. If I if I want to build a law firm, I don't have yeah. to. I don't have to hang up a shingle and kind totally. of do it that way. We can totally. we, we can kind of move into yeah. something more interesting. Yeah. So I I, I hope for the industry yeah. that it ends up being the, the smashing success it, that P three was. Look, it's 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 a way to get really innovative and creative without working so hard. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah, that's I, the, I, I, look, I, I you know litigation also, technology also, brought also, me also, here. Also, also David Pearl is main but, goal. But man, that's a heavy <laughs> lift. You know that is a heavy lift, and we hear that like, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing on a you know an AI platform for my contracts or, the, or or whatever it is, and and they should do that, right? Lawyers should do that for sure. It'll add value and it'll it'll better their business and their practice. But man, that's you know that's a lot of change management and a lot of work. Um, if you could add legal capital to your sort of toolbox to to innovate and be creative and and sort of you know take cost and risk off the table at least to some extent um, without a whole lot of change management and and sort of heavy lifting you can really generate some value for your law firm and, and corporate legal part that's what you know that's, Greg, that's what drove me here i'm so happy we got to hang out yeah this is awesome this is amazing Listen, yeah really good stuff awesome thank you zach Appreciate it.